Hello. Welcome to the first International Symposium on Cognitive Architecture. I'm John Laird and I'm going to give an introduction to cognitive architecture. Cognitive architecture has been around for many years. Two of the giants are Alan Newell and John Anderson. In 1990, in the book Unified Theories of Cognition, Alan Newell wrote, Our ultimate goal is a unified theory of cognition. This will be expressed, I have maintained, as a theory of the architecture of, the, of human cognition, that is, of the fixed or slowly varying structure that forms the framework for the immediate processes of cognitive performance and learning. This was in contrast to the idea that cognition is made up of task-specific modules that somehow are learned and integrate together in order to perform performance. So the idea in cognitive architecture is that complex cognition arises from a combination of a fixed set of task-independent computational mechanisms, such as perception, memories, representations, learning mechanisms, decision-making mechanisms, and the motor system, as well as knowledge that uses those capabilities for doing specific tasks. And that knowledge, some of it will be innate, and some of it will be learned through experience. One way to think about cognitive architecture is in comparison and contrast to computer architecture. On the left of the screen is a standard stack for computer architecture. At the lowest level, it's computer hardware, but then on top of that is computer architecture. And the idea of computer architecture is it provides a level of constant processing that can be assumed by all the software running above it. So that means that as the hardware changes, the cognitive architecture stays consistent. And then the software can assume that level. And so one of the ideas in cognitive architecture is similar to this. Now, of course, we in developing these systems today are developing on top of a, co of a computer hardware, but the idea is we have a cognitive architecture that provides the fixed mechanisms and what's on top of that instead of computer programs such as in Java or Python is the knowledge and goals of the agent that it learns over time. Some of that's gonna be task specific, some of that's gonna be general capabilities such as language processing or some problem solving strategies, but together that with the um, knowledge that the system has for its tasks and its goals is going to what produces behavior. So here we have this right area of regularity is what's the computer architecture. So uh, one of the important things for me in understanding cognitive architecture is to think about the different time scales of behavior that Newell laid out. These go from the biological band at the very lowest level to the cognitive band, to the rational band, and the social band. And the idea is that when we think of human behavior, it's really important to understand which of these timescales we're talking about. And we're talking about timescales that differ by orders of magnitude. So one of the ideas is that there are regularities at these different timescales that can be studied, somewhat independent of the timescales above them or below them. It's sort of similar to the concept in the physical sciences. When we think of physics, we can talk about the very low level um, physical activities that are happening at very minute timescales. And then when we talk about chemistry, we might have some interaction with physics, but there are regularities in chemistry that we can study independent of physics. And when we get to biology, similar, there are biological regularities that for the some cases we can study independent of chemistry. Sometimes we need to be informed by that, but that is often very independent of the underlying physics. And the idea of thinking about cognition in this way is that we can study different levels of cognition at these different timescales somewhat independently of the levels before them, below them. Now, sometimes the level directly below them is going to show through and have an impact on what happens at a given level, but, some, but often what we can do is come up with regularities that we can study independent of all the levels below. So if we can identify some different bands here, one of the most important band for cognitive architecture has been the deliberate act band. This is where we hypothesize that primitive acts of where decisions are made happen in the cognitive system. And this is somewhere around 100 milliseconds. Often in cognitive architectures that try to model human behavior, you will see this at 50 milliseconds. And the idea is that we can talk about regularities and we can talk about the errors that people make and predicting timescales by looking at this level um, and then building up from that. 
if we try to map this onto Kahneman's levels of behavior, his system one and system two, you can think broadly or somewhat um, in general that somewhere between a tenth of a second and a second is where system one happens. This is where behavior happens very quickly, but without bringing a lot of knowledge, a lot of deliberation together. So that there might be a single deliberative stack or a act or a few, but it's when we get up to the unit task where there's time for many of these very simple deliberative acts to be composed together that we start getting the more rational behavior that we see in system two. I also like to identify system zero, which is the underlying implementation. In humans, this, these are neural circuits and below that neurons and so on. However, when we map these onto computer systems, this is going to be how we implement it in a computer. So often we will have uh, cognitive architectures that focus in on the deliberate band and have uh, and are somewhat agnostic as to the underlying implementation in system zero. Let's focus in now more on the cognitive band it's right here. So here we have between 100 milliseconds and about 10 seconds. So the deliberative acts are things like primitive internal actions, accessing long-term memory. These are things you have no conscious access to, but are the components of any kind of uh, reasonable, rational thought. Those are then composed together into very simple reasoning that can happen into about a second. Um, skilled language processing, uh, so things that you don't really realize you're doing in order to process internal, uh, I mean, process language as you're processing it. And above that are simple tasks. And this is where more complex cognitive capabilities come into play, such as doing a short bit of planning, maybe some meta reasoning or some analogy. So you see that each one of these is built up from the level below. And the cognitive architecture hypothesis is not that planning is a separate module, but it actually is a composition of the levels below. And we can talk about how planning might be composed of, say, a hundred different actions that are happening at that low level where we're doing memory um, accesses to long-term memory. Similar, that's the case is for uh, complex reasoning and meta-reasoning. Now, one of the things we see that supports this in my mind is we see this intermixing in cogn cognitive capabilities. We don't see us sticking in planning. We see us being able to merge, be working on planning, suddenly ask someone a question, use language for a while, and move back and forth. So I see that this is one of the really strengths of humans is we're not stuck in one type of reasoning all the time. We can move back and forth very quickly. The other thing we see is ubiquitous learning. Anytime we do one of these very long, these longer time scales activities over and over again, what happens? We learn about it. And that then ends up getting pushed down into faster and faster capabilities. So that something that originally took us 10 seconds to do might, as we practice it, take it a one seconds to do and then get even faster over that. And that's one of the ubiquitous things you see in human behavior. It's what's called the power law of learning is that as people perform tasks, they get faster and faster. And in the view of Kahneman, this is the compilation of system two behavior into system one. If we think of AI tasks, um, we can think of them as mostly being individual with individual architectures. We might have game playing tasks, such as StarCraft and poker. Some of these can use the under, same underlying architecture, but often they're very independent. We also have completely different tasks like Jeopardy or diagnosing imaging analysis or autonomous driving or detecting patterns in patient records for screening and treatment or AI systems that do literature analysis and summarization. Each of these is an extremely impressive system on its own, but it is that, a system on its own. It is not a system that can do a lot of different tasks. And if we think, if we keep going down this trajectory where we will, we're going to end up with systems that are these isolated systems. They're almost like little stars in the sky. And so as we go into the future, if we continue down this, we're going to end up with something like the star field, where we have individual systems that might be very, very good on an individual task, but they can't do another task. And uh, we all have to sp spend all of our time doing these individual tasks. So that is one of my concerns, is that if we want to build general AI systems, we need to go beyond these individual tasks. 
Now, one of the th ask is, well, how does this happen? Well, this happens in that we have very task-specific AI programs, ones that are customized with their sensing, representations, processing, and learning. The advantage is, given the way we develop systems right now, we get improved efficiency. We can eliminate irrelevant reasoning. For example, a chess program, when it's playing chess, does not get distracted by the sort of things that a human would get distracted from. It is only doing chess. So it, it and same thing with a Go program. When it's learning to play Go, that's all it's doing. And so that makes the system for that task very efficient. It also allows us to optimize the size of the computer that runs the task, the knowledge, and everything for it. The disadvantage is that that gives us real limits on generality and robustness. We build systems that really fit the task, and if we might need to redesign or retrain them if there's small deviations. For example, if we take the system that can play StarCraft and we change the rules a little bit in StarCraft, the expectation is we would have to retrain that system from scratch so that it could learn its behavior over again given those um, changes in, in the rules. There is still a lot of human expert involvement in those systems, so um, they, they have to have humans to formulate the systems, to tune parameters, to optimize these systems. And there is really limits to the knowledge transfer and reuse that can be used across other domains. However, if we look at human behavior, we see a different landscape for how human knowledge and tasks are. And so I think the way I see that is that humans might not have all the individual stars where they have experts in all the ideas, but there's a lot of areas where we do have expertise. And in the areas we don't have expertise, we still have the ability to do those tasks. And there might be many areas where we don't do very well on them, but we can learn to do them. So we are much more blended throughout that. And so the underlying question is how do we build systems that have this human capability to do many tasks and use lots of different kinds of knowledge. And that is where we come back to cognitive architecture. So if we look at the shared goals of cognitive architecture, it is to develop these task independent, fixed computational mechanisms that underlie all intelligence, a unified theory of cognition. Now, not all cognitive architectures are designed to be as universal as this. Some are for subsets of tasks, but the idea is not to build a system for a single task but to build one that, based on the knowledge it has, can do different tasks. The other th and that is the second point I want to make, which is that these architectures support the encoding and use of a multiplicity of types of knowledge, both innate knowledge and learned knowledge. And this supports both simple and complex cognitive capabilities. My own hypothesis is that complex capabilities come through a lot of knowledge that is added to cognitive architectures so, um, saying what all these little small inferences are and how they combine together. Now, although there's a lot of commonality in cognitive architecture research, there's also some significant differences. And I've tried to lay out three basic differences in the goals of researchers in cognitive architecture. And this leads to three or more different areas that you will find in cognitive architecture research. So at one level, there are people interested in biological modeling. They want to build systems out of neurons and that they want to get that to a level of cognitive architecture and ask how do we get uh, neural systems to do the basics of uh, the manipulations we see in other cognitive architectures. Uh, sort of the coin of the realm here is to predict neural activity and cognitive behavior. And these are systems that usually are um, designed to work at shorter timescales, although that has been changing over time. Two examples are Randy O'Reilly's system Libra and Chris Elismith and his collaborators' system called Spawn. One of the lectures at the VSCA conference is on a new version of Spawn. There's also interest in psychological modeling. So maybe not thinking it at the neural level, but still asking how can we build a system that has the same behavior as humans, has the same strengths and the same weaknesses, and gives us a big understanding of why there are weaknesses in human reasoning. So these systems are not to build a single model on one task, but to perform human 
tasks across a wide range of cognitive tasks. Usually the goal here is to predict things like human reaction time and error rates for psychological tasks, and these are tasks that take seconds to minutes. Now some of these systems also make predictions down at the biological level, but not usually at the individual neuron level, but say are making predictions as to what areas of the brain are active when certain of the basic actions in the, those cognitive architectures are um, going on. And so they will also make predictions at the brain level. Um, some of the examples are ACT-R, which has been around for many years, um, EPIC, Clarion, LIDA, CREST, and FORECAPS. All of these try to make predictions about human behavior. The third area I'm going to highlight are systems built to uh, create AI systems. So instead of building AI systems for single tasks, as we saw earlier, this is trying to take that I, the idea of what humans have and be able to create system, AI systems that can do many different tasks. So, and try to get this towards human level intelligence. These are usually inspired by psychology and biology. However, they often will not try to make um, behavioral predictions such as timing and error rates. So they often also make more um, emphasis on complex cat cognition, such as planning, problem solving, and those sorts of things at longer time scales. My own system SOAR is an example of this, as well as Companions, Sigma, Icarus, Cogprime, and a few others. So I think we, we see how there's these three different bands. Now, any one system might actually cross these bands. So let's take, for example, um, ACT-R. ACT-R has been used all, to make some predictions about uh, the brain, but also to build real systems that are of practical use. Similarly, in SOAR, most of our emphasis has been on building uh, AI applications, but we have often, we have also sometimes used it to make predictions about human reaction times and error rates. So we see a blending of the goals in, in many of these systems. If we come back to humans, uh, Newell's timescales of human action, and we can try and lay out where some of these uh, architectures fit in terms of these timescales. Now, this is my own estimation, and the authors of these uh, systems might disagree, but this might give you a little bit of idea about how these ones with these different goals are going to focus on these different bands. So, for example, the systems that are more biologically oriented are going to go all the way, go all the way down to the 100 microsecond level, but they also try to go up and, and do some kinds of tasks. Um, the ones that are doing psychological modeling are doing unit tasks and sometimes um, going up even much farther than that. The AI systems are also um, span uh, multiple time scales, but do not usually go below the 100 millisecond level. To give you an idea of one cognitive architecture, just so that you have an exemplar, makes sense for me to show you the cognitive architecture I've been working on for the last 30 years, and it's called SOAR. So SOAR is distinguished by having a symbolic working memory, which is very, uh, common in cognitive architectures. Uh, that is where it has relational representations of the current situation, also the goals that it's been um, trying to obtain or achieve. And below that, you'll see that it also has perception coming into it and action going out of it. One of the other aspects of SOAR is it has the system called the spatial visual system. This is corresponds to what you might think of as mental imagery, where the system is able to reason using images or um, objects in 3D space, sort of like a game physics engine. And those allow it to make certain kinds of reasoning that are very difficult to do with purely symbolic reasoning. Above the symbolic working memory, you also see that SOAR has long-term memories. These are where it learns new concepts and new skills. Um, at the left is procedural memory, that's where skills are encoded and those are encoded as symbolic rules. It also has semantic memory where it encodes knowledge about the world that are similar to facts. And then there's episodic memory where there's knowledge about the past experiences. Just to give you a little idea of how these different components might play in a simple problem, I'm just gonna give you a little task to do, uh, very simple, and maybe this will give you an idea of how we would conceive of these different memories being used and processing being used in a human. So imagine the word wow. For us, that would then come into spatial visual memory. 
I then ask you to rotate that. That requires going um, into procedural memory to access a skill about doing rotation. Now that's not something that can be done in symbolic working memory. Instead, that's something that would happen in spatial visual system where that would get rotated and we would then get the word mom, which would then be processed by recognition systems that would then create the symbol mom in symbolic working memory. Then I can ask you, when was the last time you saw the spouse of that person? Well, that would require you ac accessing semantic memory to get information about what are spouses. And that would be that that would be your father. And then you would access episodic memory to ask the question, when was the last time I saw my father? And that would give you back an answer. So this just tries to give you an idea of how these different memories are, and processes are used to solve a problem. And that how, it, at least in these systems, it is not seen as just one um, homogenous set of neurons. So another thing I think is worth pointing out is how is cognitive architecture different than, say, Java or Python or some other programming language? Well, to first, to first off, these systems have a continual processing cycle. Um, in standard programming cycle computers, I'm sorry, programming languages, in order to get them to do something, you have to write some code so that they are doing some processing. You might do some while loops or for loops so that they continue to do processing over time. In a cognitive architecture, there is an ongoing pro continual processing cycle. And here is the one in SOAR, just to give you an example. Inputs coming in. We then have rules firing that are doing elaboration and proposing of actions to perform. They're called operators in SOAR and that are choosing between them. At some point, an operator is selected. And then there's additional rules that um, specify how those are going, that's supposed to be applied. That application can involve either going to output or retrieving things from long-term memory. And then the system cycles back around and goes, takes input in and then cycles through. So it's always cycling through, always accessing its memories in order to do processing. And this is very different than what you see in standard programs that have a program counter, which is you are at this point and then you go to this point. I should say that the processing, even though it's serial across the cycle, each one of these phases is, happens in parallel, and though I don't show it, accessing to the long-term memories, such as semantic memory and episodic memory, also happens in parallel. The other thing is that they often have a fixed small set of primitive data representations that are used to represent a model of the world. Often these are symbolic lists or graphs with non-symbolic values. But it's not like in standard programming languages where you have arrays, record structures, uh, trees, um, and, and all sorts of things. They're usually, we start with very uh, general, simple data structures such as graph structures and build the kinds of knowledge structures we need out of those. And as I've mentioned multiple times, these systems have multiple long-term memories and learning mechanisms that are automatically saving away knowledge over time. So these are ways, in some sense, cognitive architectures differ th from a standard programming language. Now, almost all the cognitive architectures allow you to interface with standard programming languages. So, for example, for SOAR, um, we don't write the sensors and uh, effector systems in SOAR. Instead, the, the input and output are interfaced to programming languages like Python or Java, which then control sensors or effectors. The other part of these systems is they can have significant innate knowledge that um, are, is, comes with them that is used for almost all tasks, in addition to the knowledge that's learned. One of the cool things is that there was a review recently of 40 years of cognitive architecture. So we sort of have something that tells us what's happened over the last 40 years and where are we in terms of cognitive capabilities. So this was a survey of 84 cognitive architectures done at York University. Of those, 49 are still under active development. And this was based on 2,500 publications covering 40 years of research. An amazing piece of work to go through those publications and extract out the knowledge in this paper. So it provides a timeline and taxonomy of different kinds of cognitive architectures, examines the core cognitive capabilities in terms of which architectures have strengths and weaknesses in the different areas, and it then categorizes over 900 practical applications of cognitive architectures. In addition to the paper itself, there are visualizations and a full bibliography that's available at this website. 
So uh, you might want to pause the video now and, and write this down so that you can access it later. So this shows a graphic of how the different cognitive architectures have been developed over time and how, um, which of these are still active. So anything at the right-hand side are cognitive architectures that are still actively developed and being used. Whereas at, um, you see the staggered view of when they started across the timeline at the bottom. So the first cognitive architectures um, started about 30 to 40 years ago. And then there's been a continual increase in cognitive architectures over time. I guess in about 2005, there was a growth in about six cognitive architectures, but overall that's been a steady growth. This also shows different kinds of cognitive architectures. So there's the green ones, which are mostly purely symbolic. Um, there's the uh, red ones, which are mostly neural ones. They're labeled emergent. Um, the th trouble is a lot of these architectures have different emergent capabilities in them, so it's hard to use that as a criteria. But that's one that's been used in the literature a lot. Um, I would prefer that they were more neural-based or something like that. And then there's hybrid architectures, which are a combination of symbolic and non-symbolic, say, um, uh, numeric processing. That doesn't mean they're necessarily a combination of symbolic and neural processing. Definitely there are ones like that, which let me just pick out one. Clarion is an excellent example that has both symbolic processing and neural processing. But the hybrids, for example, SOAR, it uses symbolic representations for many of the things it does. It also has those non-symbolic images, and it also has a lot of metadata, of, such as the recency and frequency of when data has come in and out of the architecture that it uses to making decisions. So uh, you have to be careful when you're talking about hybrid that there's a lot of different kinds of hybrids. So where are we now? So currently, you know, over the 40 years, we have gotten to a large spectrum of cognitive capabilities and applications. We have both these engineered systems and the more neural systems. Um, overall, there has been a focus on high-level cognition, but I think you're also seeing a growth in other areas as well. Uh, there is a gap between cognitive architecture and the recent advances in deep learning. Some cognitive architectures are trying to in, um, integrate aspects of deep learning into their perception systems, uh, but we haven't seen that be um, really a, a significant movement just as yet. Although there are, you know, pure neural systems like Spawn and Libra that do have, you know, that are neurally based. Um, if we look at the number of architectures, 84, we see that a lot of them implement the core capabilities of perception, action selection, memory, and reasoning. Um, and then there's sort of a drop off. Um, many of them implement uh, action in the world, learning, uh, very, uh, a lot fewer do things like motivation, meta reasoning, and cre creativity. Uh, what's missing? Very few of them have realistic perception. That's still an un unsolved problem in um, neural systems and uh, psychology and AI. So I think we still have a lot of work to do there. Not many of these systems have full-blown communication capabilities because of the difficulty of natural language. And metacognition and episodic memory are things that have come along in the last 10 years, um, but we still don't see as ubiquitous as would be nice. So uh, by stepping back and, and looking at cognitive architectures being in the field for over 30 years, what are the common types of issues and controversies we find in the field? And I think this gives you an idea when you hear some of the other talks in this symposium, uh, what are maybe people responding to and maybe what are some of the research issues going forward? Well, clearly one of the key issues that always is uh, forefront of cognitive architectures are what are those mechanisms that are going to be the fixed ones in a cognitive architecture? Which ones are we saying these are there um, and that other things build on top of them through innate or learned knowledge? So if things are put in the architecture, there are some advantages. Um, you might think, well, let's have a minimal architecture as much as possible and have everything learned. But when things are in the architecture, they can be optimized and be very efficient. They become universal available for all tasks and they have access to metadata, meaning there is access to knowledge, I mean, information about the knowledge that's been learned that can be used. 
This is really important in learning um, because you often want to know how often a fax has been around or how recent has been around. And that might be very difficult or expensive if it's not represented in the architecture. If we put it in the knowledge, it makes the system more adaptable. It makes it so that it can be task specific. So there are definitely advantages to try and make as much, not, um, as much aspects of the, of the system available to knowledge. But you can see that there's a tension here and we see that across architectures as to whether or not things like, should there be meta reasoning? Is that a capability that should be part of the architecture? Or should that be an, um, maybe some basic functionality in the architecture, but most of the meta reasoning occurs through, uh, um, through knowledge-based reasoning. Once we decide on having some mechanisms, do we have a single mechanism or do we have multiplicities of mechanisms to handle the different types of situations in which that can occur? A classic one is whether or not um, in declarative memories we have a, a single memory such as an act R or you have uh, separate memories for semantic memory and episodic memory. Now there's uh, psychological data on both sides of this issue and I see this as a continuing controversy but I think these controversies are great because it leads people to look for um, aspects of human behavior and also functionality that you get from having either, either a single or a multiplicity of them. So I think these are how the field actually grows. Uh, another big controversy is whether we have commitments to underlying implementation technology. So for example, in SOAR, we are agnostic on how all those aspects of SOAR are implemented. Is it implemented in C? Python or in neurons. As of today, we are agnostic on that and we try to build a system so that we have a specification for that level that is independent of how it would be implemented underneath. In uh, contrast, the, um, Spawn is a system who takes very seriously the, the level underneath. In fact, it, that is where the main research is and they ask how can they get those other kind of capabilities at the level above that using those kind of neurons. Systems like Sigma sort of are in the middle in that they try to achieve the same kind of cognitive level that SOAR does, but then have a commitment to using factor graphs and other kinds of graphical representations in order to achieve that. So that is another controversy is how many of these levels are you trying to represent and also whether you cross and whether you have commitments at the um, deliberate level on down. The, another one is whether there is support for reasoning over modality specific representation. So a lot of systems um, are mostly using symbolic representations, which is sort of extract, um, abstracting away from wherever that information came from. Did it come from speech, vision, or whatever? And that's one of the things humans have that capability of, of doing that, some kinds of reasoning over that kind of thing. Or do they also include some types of reasoning for more uh, modality specific representations, such as mental imagery? We face this issue in SOAR, and one of the things we have done is introduce a modality specific representations for mental imagery. Ment mental imagery. Although that um, not for many problems that is not necessary, but we have found for certain problems it becomes very useful. And another representation question across the span of cognitive architectures is whether symbols are represented explicitly or whether they're implicit. Um, many of the cognitive architectures, um, well, all the symbolic cognitive architectures and many of the AI ones, they have explicit representations of sim symbols and many of the psycholo more psychology-based ones do too. However, um, the neural representations, although they have, uh, they, they have symbols or they have the functionality that you get with symbol systems, and they get that through implicit representations, say large vectors of numbers that then um, have, are able to achieve many of the processes that we associate with symbol manipulation. So that's definitely a controversy or issue that we see in cognitive architectures. And finally, this is more um, not, not in terms of the architecture themselves, but in terms of how they're used. Uh, many cognitive architectures are developed with the idea of being used in real world um, tasks. Um, and so they have to make uh, real time constraints. That has become much easier over the years as computers have gotten faster and faster. But there are also then some systems 
which um, are only run in simulation or then slower than real time. I believe they all have aspirations to run real time. Um, and but, you know, given today's computers, that is not possible, but that that is something that they are continually doing research to achieve. And finally, there is research in cognitive architecture, which is more theoretical, where that complete specification of the architecture is not done, but instead a theoretical uh, specification is made. Now, one of the difficulties in cognitive architecture is the implementation. Um, building up cognitive architectures is very expensive and is a huge software engineering effort. I've been working on this for more than 30 years, and over those years, I've had uh, many students and uh, research programmers put huge amounts of effort into SOAR in order to get it where it is today. And so that is a commitment that is often very difficult to achieve, and I have a 30-year head start over a lot of other people. So coming into this and trying to create a cognitive architecture from scratch can be extremely daunting, so you can expect to see a lot of theoretical specifications. All right, so one of the things that you saw was 84 different cognitive architectures. At one level, that's um, pretty daunting and, and is a little scary in terms of thinking, well, do I have to really understand 34 different cognitive architectures to understand the field of cognitive architectures? And today that might be the case, but we are trying to move into a different world where we try to extract and focus not so much on the differences between cognitive architectures, but are there a set of commonalities that sort of define a theoretical construct of cognitive architecture? And so uh, together with Paul Rosenblum and Christian LeBaire, I came up, uh, we developed something called the Common Model of Cognition. We real, originally called it the standard model of the mind, but through a community effort, which this is, we decided to rename it the con cognitive model of cognition. Now, the idea is to extract out from multiple uh, cognitive architectures, what are their commonalities? What commitments do they make in terms of compu um, computational processing that is consistent? So we can sort of say, you know, all these systems are um, in line with the common model, they differ in these ways, and maybe humans differ in these ways, but that then provides a starting point. So we can then talk about how there are similarities to the con con common model and then how there are differences. So it's not a cognitive architecture itself, and I don't see it ever being. It is more a this um, abstract specification, and we can talk about how specific cognitive architectures are consistent with it or not. It's still missing many components. You can see that in terms of just the block diagram, it is very um, simple. It has a working memory and a procedural long-term memory and declared long-term memory and perception and motor. That's about as basic as you can be, but that's not to say that all cognitive architectures actually agree with this kind of um, classification, but a lot of them do. So we have these communicating models um, and one of the hopes is that this provides a baseline to facilitate shared progress over time, and it does provide a testable theory of the different structures of the mind. So in terms of the kind of processing we hypothesize for the common model is that it's based on these few test independent modules. I think we believe that there's more modules than this, but this is our starting point. So we expect that it's incomplete and we'll have to expand over time. There is a cognitive cycle that we can't show in this diagram, but it runs at 50 milliseconds per cycle, and that as humans are making decisions and accessing procedural memory, for example, that's happening at every 50 milliseconds, and that there this is this basic sequential action selection happening at that one time. Um, there's parallel throughout the ism throughout the architectures in addition to the sequentiality. So there's parallel processing within the individual modules. So for example, um, declarative memory will have parallel access to it and that there's parallel between modules. So it's possible that at the same time procedural memory is doing a retrieval, there is being a retrieval done in declarative memory, perception is working, and the motor system. So all of these modules can be working at the same time. And that complex behavior arises from a sequence of these individual cognitive cycles at 50 milliseconds. So something that is very complicated um, is going can be decomposed into a set of very simple uh, um, operations that are happening at the 15 millisecond level. And finally, 
Not surprising, we assume that there is learning mechanisms associated with every each of the long-term memories. And there might be multiple learning mechanisms associated with them. So um, a learning mechanism associated with procedural learning, procedural memory, a learning mechanism associated with the declarative learning mechanisms. And also um, with perce perception in the motor system, although no commitment on that has been done for the common. Well, thank you for listening to this introduction. I hope it's helpful. Um, if you see this past 2020, this will be a little out of date, but these are recurring meetings that you might find useful having to do with learning more about cognitive architecture. Let me just go through them quickly. There's the Artificial General Intelligence Conference. I apologize for um, spelling intelligence incorrectly. Uh, th that will be June 23 through 26. Um, the International Conference on Cognitive Modeling, Advances in Cognitive Systems, and the Brain-Inspired Cognitive Architectures for Artificial Intelligence. All of these, I believe, this year will be virtual. Some of them might have associated in-person conferences. I think we'll find out as they go along. One of the exciting things is to see how these will be done and the different experimentations and how presentations are done. Another conference that is potentially also relevant is the Cognitive Science Conference. Well, I hope you come back next year. We will have another VISCA conference in 2021, sometime between May and June. Um, it will be online. It will be invited speakers. And if you are interested in participating, send me an email, John Laird, Laird, L-A-I-R-D, at umich.edu. And I hope you visit the VISCA website. All the other talks are available there. Thank you and goodbye.